Would a gospel still be a gospel if there was no virgin birth, no betrayal, no arrests, no trial, no suffering, no crucifixion, and no resurrection? Because the Gospel of Thomas doesn't have any of these things, but it still claims to be a gospel filled with the good news of salvation. But in this gospel, you don't achieve salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. In the Gospel of Thomas, salvation is only obtained when you, as an individual, are able to correctly interpret the secret sayings of Jesus Christ. Then, and only then, can you achieve everlasting life. And these are the opening lines of the Gospel of Thomas. The Gospel of Thomas is the most popular and well-known writing from the Nag Hammadi Library, because it claims to contain secret sayings of Jesus Christ. This is not too out of the ordinary, considering many Gnostic writings claim to have secret information from Jesus Christ. But what separates the Gospel of Thomas apart from the other Gnostic writings is that many scholars believe that some of the sayings found within the Gospel of Thomas could actually go back to the historical Jesus of Nazareth in the first century. The Gospel of Thomas is very unlike the canonical New Testament Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and this is for a variety of reasons. The first reason is that the Gospel of Thomas has no narrative. That is to say, it doesn't read like a story. It has 114 sayings, or logia, of Jesus Christ. These 114 sayings have no context, other than what little we can discern from the individual sayings themselves. It's written as if someone was just sort of jotting down what they heard Jesus say. What makes the Gospel of Thomas so fascinating is that some of the sayings sound like things we've heard before, things that are familiar to us from the New Testament. But then other sayings are completely and wildly different from anything the New Testament ever says. And this has led to countless scholarly debates about what is actually true in this gospel. Does this gospel really contain lost, authentic sayings from the historical Jesus Christ? There are four manuscripts of the Gospel of Thomas in total. One completely intact Coptic version, and three very incomplete Greek fragments. The completely intact Coptic version of the Gospel of Thomas survives as the second tractate, or book, in Codex II of the Nag Hammadi Library. The Nag Hammadi Library is a collection of ancient, mostly Gnostic texts discovered in 1945 just outside the small town of Nag Hammadi, Egypt. Scholars knew that the Gospel of Thomas existed before it was discovered at Nag Hammadi in 1945 because of a few very fragmentary Greek papyrus scraps that were found in a trash heap in Oxyrhynchus, Egypt. These are known as Papyrus Oxyrhynchus I, 654 and 655. Scholars also knew about the Gospel of Thomas from early Christian literature, especially Hippolytus of Rome and his refutation of all heresies. But it's also mentioned in the writings of Origen and Cyril of Jerusalem. These church fathers, as they were called, deemed the Gospel of Thomas a heretical writing, meaning they did not think it represented the correct or true form of Christianity. So even though scholars knew the Gospel of Thomas has existed for centuries, it wasn't until 1945 in the discovery of the Coptic version at Nag Hammadi that we finally got the completely intact version of the Gospel of Thomas, meaning it wasn't fragmentary. It was the whole thing. Dating the Gospel of Thomas can actually be pretty tricky because first you have to ask yourself what it is that you're trying to date. Are you trying to date the Coptic Nag Hammadi version or the Greek fragments? Or are you trying to figure out when the original autograph was written? And by the original autograph, I mean not a copy, but when it was first written. Because our four manuscripts of the Gospel of Thomas right now are copies, and probably copies of copies of the original. And actually, dating the Gospel of Thomas can get even trickier yet, because many scholars believe that parts of the Gospel of Thomas were written before other parts. So then you'd have to figure out what sayings go back to the first century and what sayings go back to the second century. Each individual saying can be looked at and dated independently. And when you have 114 sayings, that is going to take some time to parse out what's 1st century and what's 2nd century. But with all of that said, we can relatively easily date the Coptic Nag Hammadi version of the Gospel of Thomas to around the middle of the 4th century, so around 350 CE. The Greek fragments found in Oxyrhynchus, Egypt date much earlier, to at least the first half of the 3rd century, around 200 to 235 CE. But scholars were able to deduce that the Greek fragments were copies, not the original. So the original Greek version of the Gospel of Thomas perhaps dates to as early as the turn of the 1st century, between 90 to 140 CE. Sorensen Giverson stated that on papyrological grounds, the Gospel of Thomas may have even been written during or even before the writing of the Gospel of John, 
and could be contemporary with the writing of the Gospel of Luke, which most scholars would agree is the third gospel chronologically to have been written. Yet other scholars believe that some of the sayings in the Gospel of Thomas were likely originally written in Aramaic and could go all the way back to 50 CE, which would be earlier than all of the New Testament Gospels. The reason some scholars believe this is because there is a hypothesis that the first written material about Jesus was a collection of sayings. This can be seen in the hypothesized Q Gospel. Q theoretically exists and also has no narrative, but is a collection of sayings of Jesus. And the theory is that the gospel writers used the Q gospel to aid them in writing their gospel. And this is one of the reasons why the Gospel of Thomas is the most famous and popular non-canonical gospel. And yes, for now, I'm going to call it a non-canonical gospel instead of a Gnostic gospel, because Gnosticism is kind of a slippery term, and many scholars even today are still debating as to what constitutes a Gnostic writing and what does not. But there is still one more form of dating we have to talk about, and that is the dating of the individual sayings. Some sayings can be dated earlier or later, depending upon a number of different factors. Many scholars like April DeConnick and Nicola Dinsey Lewis would agree that the Gospel of Thomas was compiled and written in phases and likely looked different as time went on. We can see this by just comparing the Coptic version and the Greek versions we have. These two different versions do indeed differ from one another. Some sayings could date back to the historical Jesus himself, and others almost certainly do not. We know the kind of debates they were having in the first century and in the second century. We can look at early Christian writings to figure out what were Christians focused on and interested in in the first century compared to what they were focused on and interested in in the second century. And in the Gospel of Thomas, there are sayings that scholars are fairly certain do indeed go back to the first century, but then again, there's others that are clearly second century. I'll give you a few examples of ones that are likely to be from the first century right now. Saying 12. The disciples said to Jesus, We know that you are going to leave us. Who will our leader be? Jesus said to them, No matter where you have come from, you are to go to James the Just, for whose sake heaven and earth came into being. Saying 97, Jesus said, The Father's kingdom is like a woman who was carrying a jar full of meal. While she was walking along a distant road, the handle of the jar broke, and the meal spilled behind her along the road. She did not know it. She had not noticed a problem. When she reached her house, she put the jar down and discovered that it was empty. Scholars believe that these two sayings are indeed from the first century. Saying 12 likely represents a first century saying because in the first century, there were debates between Pauline Christians or Christians who sympathized with Paul and his dualistic theology and his unique flavor of eschatology versus James' flavor of Christianity, which focused heavily on transforming this world and didn't focus so much on life after death, like Paul did. This type of debate makes the most sense in the first century. In saying 97, the one about the woman spilling her jar of meal on the ground is a parable, much like the ones we would have in the New Testament. And even though this parable is not found in the New Testament anywhere, the parable style seems to go back to the historical Jesus in the first century. These are obviously scholarly guesses. We do not know absolutely that this is the case. But imagine somebody reading an article 200 years from now, and in the article, the article talks about MySpace, the social media platform that was popular around 2005 to 2009-ish. It's gonna be pretty clear when that article was written. It wouldn't be written in 1947 because MySpace didn't exist in 1947. But it's likely not to have been written in 2020 because MySpace is not very influential. It was dominated by Facebook and Twitter. And so we could be pretty confident that the article about MySpace was written between 2005 to 2009. The same can be said for the Gospel of Thomas. There are little clues or little hints of information in there that can help us when we're trying to date the individual sayings. Having said that, here are some examples of the clearly second century sayings. Saying 28, Jesus said, I took my stand in the midst of the world, and in flesh I appeared to them. I found them all drunk, and I did not find any of them thirsty. My soul ached for the children of humanity, because they are blind in their hearts, and they do not see. For they came into the world empty, and they also seek to depart from the world empty. But meanwhile, they are drunk. When they shake off their wine, then they will change their ways. Saying 84, Jesus said, When you see your likeness, you are happy. 
But when you see your image that came into being before you, and that neither die nor become visible, how much you will bear. These sayings include words like drunkenness, which would be anachronistic, or at least out of place for the first century. Therefore, scholars date this to the second century. So to summarize, the date of composition for each of the 114 sayings is still debated by scholars, but we do know that some sayings can span almost a century or more. Now before we dive any deeper into what the Gospel of Thomas actually is, I think it would be wise for us to pause and think about who the ascribed author is. In other words, who is Thomas? The Thomas in the Gospel of Thomas is almost certainly supposed to be the disciple Thomas, one of the original 12 handpicked by Jesus to follow him. Information about Thomas in the Bible is pretty sparse. And actually, information about Thomas in the Gospel of Thomas is pretty sparse as well. And so he doesn't play a huge role in the biblical account or in the Gospel of Thomas. Only his name is mentioned in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and the Book of Acts. Thomas features more prominently in the Gospel of John, but even still, he plays a pretty minimal role. Thomas in John's Gospel does not look good. He looks like a very bad disciple. He is first featured in John 11, 14 through 17, in the Lazarus story, where Thomas is quoted as saying to the other disciples, let us also go so that we may die with him. This response by Thomas certainly paints him in kind of a negative way. He is essentially saying, if we go back to Judea, we are going to be killed which does logically make sense considering at this point in time in the story, there are a lot of people in Judea that want to kill Jesus and his followers. So practically speaking, Thomas isn't wrong here, but it does show him as having a lack of faith. Then there is another little story featuring Thomas, and this is found in John 14, 1 through 7. And in this passage, it's where Jesus tells his disciples that in his father's house, there will be many dwelling places and that he is going to go and prepare a place for them. Then Jesus says, and you know the way to the place where I am going. And Thomas responds, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So in this story, Thomas is basically just there because his question sparks a very interesting theological and Christological discussion. But still, Thomas looks a little bit foolish here because he is without knowledge or without gnosis. Thomas says explicitly, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Little alarm bells should be going off in our mind right now. The Gospel of John wants us to believe that Thomas is without knowledge. He does not have this special kind of gnosis. And what are the opening lines of the Gospel of Thomas? Well, the opening lines tell us that there is this secret knowledge that Thomas has, because it's his Gospel, that exists. And we have to understand this secret knowledge in order to achieve salvation. And so, in the Gospel of Thomas, Thomas has all the knowledge. He is the one that has the most important knowledge, the knowledge that leads to salvation. But in John's Gospel, Thomas is certainly not the hero. But in the Gospel of Thomas, surprise, surprise, Thomas is the hero. He is the one with all the knowledge. Let's look at saying number 13 from the Gospel of Thomas as an example of this. In this saying, Jesus asks his disciples to compare him to something and to tell him what he is like. Peter goes first and says, you are like a just messenger. Matthew goes next and says, you are like a wise philosopher. Then Thomas goes third and says, Teacher, my mouth is utterly unable to say what you are like. Ding, 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 ding. Thomas answers this question perfectly. Then Jesus tells him he has been drinking and is intoxicated from the bubbling spring that he has tended. And this bubbling spring analogy clearly refers to wisdom or a place where one goes to achieve true gnosis. Then Jesus takes Thomas away and speaks to him in private, which is very common in Gnostic writings. When Thomas comes back, the rest of the disciples ask him what Jesus told him. And Thomas tells them, If I tell you one of the sayings he spoke to me, you will pick up rocks and stone me, and fire will come from the rocks and consume you. Many Gnostic scholars, including Nicola Denzi Lewis and Dr. John D. Turner, believe that Jesus told Thomas, You are my beloved. Again, alarm bells should be going off in our minds right now. Because in John's Gospel, who is the beloved disciple? Well, it's John, of course but not so in the Gospel of Thomas. Thomas is the beloved disciple. What I hope I'm making clear here is that there is some serious conflict between John and Thomas, and we'll see this even more as we continue. 
In John's Gospel, Thomas is seen as clueless, faithless, and full of doubt. So what gives? Why is John doing this? Why is John painting Thomas in such a negative light? Well, scholars have some theories about this that we will talk about in just a minute. But first, we have one more story about Thomas in the Gospel of John, and this is the most famous story about Thomas, and it's really Thomas's claim to fame, so to speak. It's the story that gives him his moniker, the Doubting Thomas. This story is found in John 20, 19 through 29. And in this story, Jesus has already been raised from the dead and is in the process of making post-resurrection appearances to various people. Jesus appears to his disciples in a house when the doors are locked, and he shows the disciples his wounds in his hands and his side. And the disciples rejoiced when they saw him. Then Jesus commissions them and breathes on them. And when this happens, the disciples receive the Holy Spirit, which is not how the disciples received the Holy Spirit in the book of Acts, but that is neither here nor there. The point is, is that Thomas was not there, and he evidently did not receive the Holy Spirit. See what I mean? John constantly has Thomas look like a horrible disciple. He didn't even get the Holy Spirit. We are told that the disciples tell Thomas that they have seen Jesus back from the dead. And Thomas famously, or perhaps infamously, responds by saying, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands, and put my finger in the mark of the nails, and my hand in his side, I will not believe. Then, a week later, the disciples were back at the house. And this time, Thomas was also with them. And the same thing happens. The doors were locked, and Jesus just appears in the house with them. Jesus goes right to Thomas and asks him to put his finger in the holes in his hands and side. And Jesus tells Thomas not to doubt, but instead to believe. Thomas then pronounces, My Lord and my God. Then strangely, Jesus gives a little jab at him by saying, You have believed because you have seen me. Blessed are those who have not seen me and yet have come to believe. This is a little bit strange because technically the other disciples were able to see his wounds as well. So why is Thomas being singled out here? Seems a little bit unfair to me. And it's significant to note that this time when Thomas was there, Jesus never gives him the Holy Spirit. Again, singling him out. So why is this? Why does John go out of his way to make Thomas look like such a bad disciple? I mean, the other Gospels don't even mention these stories. So why does John? Well, it has been concluded by Dr. Elaine Pagels, one of the world's leading scholars in early Christianity and Gnosticism, that the Gospel of Thomas was written before the Gospel of John. And John's Gospel purposefully makes Thomas look bad as a type of ancient slam against the dangerous ideas presented in the Gospel of Thomas. And this kind of makes sense, because if you read the Gospel of Thomas and read the Gospel of John, you will see two very different conflicting theologies of who Jesus was. According to John, Jesus is the light, the way, the truth, the life. It's through externally focusing our eyes on Christ that we ultimately achieve salvation by grace through faith. Our light is our light only because Christ is within us, and Christ is the true light. But in the Gospel of Thomas, the true light is found within each of us. It's not in Christ, it's in us, because we are children of the light. Here are some examples of that. Rather, the kingdom is inside of you, and it is outside of you. The Gospel of Thomas 3.3. 3. The Gospel of Thomas saying 24 says, His disciples said, Show us the place where you are, for we must seek it. And he said to them, whoever has ears should hear. There is light within a person of light, and it shines on the whole world. And if it does not shine, it is dark. There are many other examples like this in the Gospel of Thomas, but as you can see, in the Gospel of Thomas, the light is within. This is just not John's theology at all. Just look at the prologue in John's Gospel, which is right there in the very beginning in chapter 1. This is not how John views Jesus. Jesus is the light, and the world did not recognize the light. If you've never read the prologue to John's Gospel, you should read it. So could it be that John knew about the Gospel of Thomas and wrote his Gospel as a kind of hit piece against it? Let me know what you think down in the comments. Perhaps one of the most fascinating things about the Gospel of Thomas is that so many sayings sound familiar to us. But then again, so many sayings sound totally bizarre and wild compared to what we hear in the New Testament Gospels. Here are a few sayings from the Gospel of Thomas that should sound familiar to you if you've read the New Testament. Gospel of Thomas saying 20. The disciples said to Jesus, Tell us what the kingdom of heaven is like. Jesus said to them, It is like a mustard seed. It is the smallest of all seeds. But when it falls on prepared soil, it produces a large plant and becomes a shelter for birds in the sky. 
Okay, so this is the parable of the mustard seed. We know this from Matthew 13, Luke 13, and Mark chapter 4. Another example is saying 26. Jesus said, You see the speck that is in your sibling's eye, but you do not see the beam that is in your own eye. When you can take the beam out of your own eye, then you can see clearly to take the speck out of your sibling's eye. This is another saying we can find in the New Testament, in Matthew 7 and Luke 6. It's hard to pinpoint exactly, though, how many of the 114 sayings are ones we know and how many are not, because some of the sayings are 50-50. They're kind of halvesies. Half of the sayings like, yeah, I've heard that before, and then the conclusion of the saying is like, okay, now that's different. All right, so now on to the fun ones. Here are some examples of some sayings from the Gospel of Thomas that are definitely not found in the New Testament. Saying seven, Jesus said, blessed is the lion that the human will eat so that the lion becomes human and cursed is the human that the lion will eat and the lion will become human. Saying 10, Jesus said, I have thrown fire upon the world and look, I am watching it until it blazes. Saying 15, Jesus said, when you see the one who was not born of a woman, fall on your faces and worship because that is your father. Saying 56, Jesus said, whoever has come to know the world has discovered a carcass. And whoever has discovered a carcass, of that person the world is not worthy. And saying 67, Jesus said, one who knows everything but lacks in oneself lacks everything. There are many more sayings in the Gospel of Thomas that are unique to the Gospel of Thomas, but I don't want to go into all of them, but I would be remiss if I didn't mention at least the number one most popular and famous saying in the Gospel of Thomas, which is saying 114. Saying 114 says, Simon Peter said to them, Mary should leave us, for females are not worthy of life. Jesus said, Look, I shall guide her to make her male so that she too may become a living spirit resembling you males. For every female who makes herself male will enter heaven's kingdom. Now, obviously, at first glance, this sounds incredibly offensive. But if there's one thing I've learned about reading the Gospel of Thomas, it is that the sayings hardly ever mean exactly what they appear to mean on the surface. There are always layers and layers of historical and philosophical precedents subsisting within each and every single saying. This is why at the beginning of the Gospel of Thomas we are told that we have to find the interpretation to these sayings, which implies that this is not easy. It's something that we must search for and dig for and read between the lines, so to speak. These stories do not just tell us up front what they mean. They are laced with hidden codes and keys that we have to crack in order to solve what they are actually talking about. So with that said, I am not going to try and decipher saying 114 for you. But if you think you know what it says, leave me a comment and let me know. Again, I'd love to hear your thoughts. Much more could be said about the Gospel of Thomas, like how it focuses heavily on unity and views dualities and binaries as bad. For examples, saying like the two shall become one, male and female should become one, and females should become male, and so on. This comes back to the belief that perfection exists as a monad, or that all things will be caught up into the all in the end. It's about unity, and this is the Gospel of Thomas's eschatological understanding. This is a cross between Platonic thought, but it's also this oneness that can be seen in the beginning of the Old Testament in the book of Genesis, when Eve was taken out of Adam. Out of one became two, and then instantly trouble came into the world. But when two become one again, we will revert back to the way things were in the very, very beginning in the Garden of Eden before the fall. That at least seems to be the view of the author of the Gospel of Thomas. It's also important to point out that in the Gospel of Thomas, Jesus has a very low Christology, meaning he's viewed as more of just a human being. A high Christology would be like John's Gospel, that believes Jesus and the Father are one. Jesus being a God, high Christology. Jesus being a human being, low Christology. There are a few sayings in the Gospel of Thomas with a higher Christology, but for the most part, Jesus is viewed in this Gospel as a wise man, speaking words of wisdom, like Solomon in the Proverbs and other Jewish wisdom literature. Because in this Gospel, it's not Jesus himself that leads to salvation, but it's the discovery of true gnosis by properly interpreting his sayings that really matter. Remember, in this Gospel, the light is found within each of us. It's our job to realize it and master it. To bring this video to a close, I would like to ask one final question, and that is, is the Gospel of Thomas a Gnostic Gospel or not?
This is controversial among scholars because scholars are still debating what constitutes a Gnostic writing and what does not. But it seems many scholars look out for Gnostic buzzwords. Words like demiurge, archons, aeons, pleroma, sophia, the great invisible spirit, barbello, or yaldeboeth. The Gospel of Thomas doesn't have any of these words. And the Gospel of Thomas doesn't have a Gnostic cosmology or theogony. So how can it be Gnostic? Well, this gospel does have a time when one disciple leaves the other disciples to hear secret information from Jesus. This is common in Gnostic gospels, like the gospel of Judas and the gospel of Mary. And it's knowledge or gnosis that leads to salvation. So this, to me, sounds like it could be considered a Gnostic gospel. But I can also understand how for some people it's not Gnostic enough to actually constitute a Gnostic writing. To conclude, this is a fascinating gospel that really might give us some insight and some real sayings into the historical Jesus of Nazareth from the first century. But we have to remember that some sayings are from the first century and other sayings likely are not. This gospel being found within the Nag Hammadi library shows us how a likely Gnostic community used it to aid their spiritual journeys. This gospel also helps us think deeply about what makes a gospel a gospel. Would Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John still be a gospel if it didn't have the virgin birth or the crucifixion or the resurrection? Would there still be good news found within or is the good news predicated on the death and resurrection accounts? For those of you who have read the Gospel of Thomas, let me know what you think of it and if you were able to discover the true interpretation of the secret sayings of Jesus Christ. And for those of you who want to go deeper into the Gospel of Thomas, I have my sources listed and linked down in the description below. If this video helped you obtain a new level of Gnosis, consider hitting that like button and subscribing to this channel for more religious and historical content. And as always, stay thirsty for knowledge, my friends.